um, and maybe one or two others, but uh, uh, those that persevere onto the end shall be saved, and uh, <laughs> so uh, here we are. And we are indeed on, the, on, on what I had um, in be our, our kind of closing lecture, in, uh, pages 223 that the, and 4 and 5, the last section of your notes, um, and I, I think we can handle this within one main session. Um, Partly, of course, because so much of, of, of what we find in Paul has already been preceded and uh, founded upon what we've been looking at all the way along already in, in, in Old Testament. But uh, before we, we begin and uh, get into these, it's always good to pray and ask for God's help. And so let's do that. Loving Father, uh, we come to the end of this uh, week together, which has been a great week, and uh, how much a privilege it has been to spend time thinking together about your word uh, and enjoying the presence of one another and the presence of your Holy Spirit with us. And so now we, we come to this uh, closing session and ask that you help us. We think about your great servant, the Apostle Paul, and uh, his missional life and career and theology, and ask that you help us as we wrestle and understand it, uh, that we may be inspired by it and taught by it, and that it will send us out with a, an increased sense of desire to participate with you in your great mission and purpose for this world. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now, you'll see at the top on page 22 that what I'm about to share with you really is what I also received, <laughs> as the Apostle Paul might well have said himself. Um, because uh, I attended a lecture given by Dr. Eddie Adams, who at least at that time was lecturing in New Testament in King's College London. I don't know if he still is, and I don't really know him personally. Uh, but it was what I found to be a very encouraging, inspiring lecture, because at that time, as you can see, in 1997, I hadn't yet written the book, The Mission of God. I was still teaching at All Nations Christian College and myself wrestling with the issues of how to read the scriptures missionally, missiologically, uh, and I found his um, helpful look at the Apostle Paul um, enormously encouraging, that here was somebody in the New Testament field thinking this way that I was trying to think and wrestle in the Old Testament field. So I, I took copious notes of his lecture, and, uh, and, and this is what I'm really sharing with you today. I always feel it's right to, you know, to attribute one's, uh, I'm really a bit of a, what's the bird that pinches things from all over the place? Is it a magpie, I think? Yeah, yeah very much a magpie in my theology. You, know, you pinch bits from all over the place and stick them together and create something new. Um, but here I'm not even really creating anything new. I'm just uh, sharing with you these thoughts, because I'm more professionally an Old Testament um, uh, scholar by, by training and profession rather than New Testament, so I, I rely on New Testament scholars for help. So we're thinking about Paul's missionary theology, not just here, as it says in the introduction, not just think, thinking about Paul's missionary methods, uh, which of course has been studied by many people throughout the history of the church. Uh, there's a, a great <coughs> book written by Roland Allen on that subject in the 1920s, uh, uh, missionary methods and Paul's are ours. Uh, did Paul have a missionary plan? Did he target certain types or groups of people? Uh, did he strategically go to certain cities? How did he use his social networks among the Jews and uh, his trade networks as in the guild of leather workers and so on? Um, how did he um, oscillate between public lecturing and public preaching and all of that? So all the missionary methods of Paul, but that's not really what I'm thinking about here, although it is an interesting um, field of inquiry. That's the first thing to say. That's, that's not what we're thinking about. But the second thing to say by way of introduction is to find the importance of Paul's so-called conversion or his encounter with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, which transformed his life uh, from a persecutor of the early followers of Jesus into being one of them, and then being the great apostle to the... Now, the account of Paul's Damascus Road experience is recorded for us in Acts in chapter 9, but, and then the reference is there, but you might like to jot down an additional reference, which is Acts 26, verses 15 to 23, because this is one of the two places where Paul repeats that experience. And given that Luke is the one who's writing the book of Acts, it must have been of tremendous significance to Luke that he devotes three precious pieces of papyrus within the book of Acts to giving accounts of Paul's conversion. Because not only does he record it in Acts chapter 9, but he also records Paul recounting it twice over. Uh, 
Um, and he could, he could just have said, well, Paul said to Agrippa what he had said to Festus, you know, summarize it in some way. But no, Luke actually gives it to us twice. But the fullest and most theological aspect of it comes in chapter 26. And it's worth reading this passage so that you can see how um, Paul's experience was simultaneously a conversion to Jesus as Messiah and as risen and a commissioning into mission to the nations. It was simultaneous. The, the two went together. And Paul always held those together uh, in the sense that if Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, whom I at first refused to believe but now have been confronted with, I've met him as Messiah, if Jesus is Messiah of Israel, then that has radical implications for the world because of his scriptural theology that uh, we were looking at yesterday that if the Messiah comes and redeems Israel, then the nations must be gathered in. So listen to the way Paul puts it here. I, I think it's worth reading the whole of this section. Um, this is Paul talking about his, his experience, and I read a little bit of this yesterday. Um, Paul says, I asked, that is, I asked Jesus, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. And I mentioned to you yesterday that servant and witness is in itself an Old Testament scriptural um, description of Israel. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles, and I am sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That is, they will come into the experience uh, that, that believing Israelites already have, that is, by being God's light and experiencing God's forgiveness. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus and then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they, i.e. all of them, Jews and Gentiles, should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. There's uh, Paul being very like James um, in, uh, in what he's saying. Repentance proved by deeds. Very John the Baptist. <laughs> very Jesus. Very James. Very Paul. Uh, verse 21, so that is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and I testify to small and great alike. And listen to this, I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. In other words, Paul says, I'm being fully scriptural here. That the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the nations, to the Gentiles. Now there's Paul's missional theology in a nutshell expressed in the context of giving his testimony. Paul says, that was my commissioning. From the moment Jesus appeared to me, he also told me that my task was to bring the knowledge of Jesus, the call to repentance, the promise of forgiveness to Israel and to the nations. So that's, uh, as it were, Paul's own self-perception of his missionary calling. The second thing that we need to look at is the missionary nature of Paul's letters. Because Paul, of course, in most of his letters was writing to churches. Of course, some were individuals, like uh, to Titus and Timothy, assuming Pauline. Of course, I know various disputes over that, but I'm personally very happy to accept the pastoral epistles as from Paul. But most of his letters were written to churches. Uh, and it's clear, therefore, that Paul's sense of his missionary task was not just the conversion of individuals, not just winning individuals to faith in Christ, although, of course, that's what he did. He would talk to Lydia, he would talk to people, he would bring people to faith, the Philippian J. His purpose in all of that was to establish communities of believers now converted around Jesus Christ and living for the Lordship of Christ in the context of the world. That was what he, that's what he was building. He was not just converting, he was building. Uh, and so he describes his ministry in that way in the passage I've referred to there, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, which is uh, one of those passages that I love very much because of the kind of work that we do in the Langham Partnership. Uh, it's, it's begun uh, when he's... Um, 
rebuking the Corinthian Christians for having made divisions between him and Apollos. You know, somewhere, you know, I'm a Paul follower, I'm an Apollos follower. And uh, Paul says, well, what after all is Apollos? What is Paul? We're only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each one his task. I planted the seed, and Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. Of course, what he's referring to is Paul's church planting evangelistic work and Apollos' teaching, nurturing, uh, watering work, um, following it up. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. And this is my favorite verse. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. Okay? They're both engaged in the same task. Uh, so when somebody asks me, is the job of Langham Partnership mission? I say, of course it is. It's the same job, it's the same task as the evangelist. We are in the business of building Christ's church. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. And so by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. Paul is constructing. And so his whole work, therefore, was the building of church communities. And his second point, his letters then continue that purpose. Uh, they are, as it were, not a second best for Paul being there in, present, in, in physical presence, but they are, in a sense, the letters that Paul sends, they are, as it were, a surrogate for him. They are him in person, but through the written word. Uh, they aim to strengthen the church, uh, to provide spiritual power, to be relevant to their issues, to uh, nurture them, teach them, correct them, in all that he does in his letters is what he would have been doing if he had been there in person. Uh, that's the way he describes the relationship between his letters and his own ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 8 to 11, uh, when there was obviously some dispute about his letters and uh, the difference between his letters and his presence. Uh, so Paul says, this is 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 8 to 11. Uh, Paul says... Uh, I, the, I will boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gives us for building you up rather than pulling you down, and not, I'll not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters, because some of you say, oh, his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. So Paul obviously wasn't a very forceful physical presence. But such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. Uh, quite an important identification of, by Paul of his apostolic presence and authority as a person, the Apostle Paul, and the apostolic authority and effectiveness of his letters, which of course is one of the dimensions therefore of why we pay attention to them because they're in the scriptures. So his letters then were aimed at the same goal as his own ministry, building up the church, encouraging the church. Now one of the things that Eddie Adams did in his lecture was to draw some sociological insights into the, an understanding of what Paul was doing in his letters and in his church nurturing work. He asked the question, sociologists study social interaction in human groups, how human groups define themselves uh, and then survive or perish as, as, uh, in society. And uh, any new grouping or any new social reality has certain needs if they're going to survive and grow and be healthy and multiply. And they could be listed as in those bullet points on page 22. That is, you need to know who you are. You need to have a sense of identity. So one of the first things that any new Christian organization will do is they give themselves a name and they produce a business card and a leaflet. <laughs> okay? Because this is who we are. Right? We have an identity. You, you really are something now when you can put a leaflet on a table and give a business card because people know who you are. But also, and so Paul does that, a lot of his letters are telling the Christians, this is who you are, this is what you have become. So he is affirming their identity in Christ. But then also, new groups need to know who they are not. There needs to be a sense of, uh, well, we're not like them. Uh, that need not be um, dismissive or negative, uh, it can be purely factual. And so I like to say that, for example, Langham Partnership, we are not an evangelistic church planting organization. That's not to decry such organizations. They have their existence and their calling, but we are not that. Uh, we are this, 
and so we have a distinctiveness, not just by what we are, but also by what we're not. And so again, you find in Paul's letters that in order to give these new little communities, very vulnerable communities of people who had come to believe in Jesus as Messiah, he gives them not only a sense of who they are in Christ very positively, but he also sets them apart. Do not be like the Gentiles. You are not this. You are not that. Uh, and so that distinctive element. And then thirdly, any new social community needs some metaphorical way of describing themselves. So even something like a, um, a theological college will want to describe itself as, well, we're all a great family here, you know. And so we use the language of family to describe the kind of community we want to be. Uh, we, we choose pictures and metaphors uh, of what we are as a social organism. And Paul does that again by not only using all the range of Old Testament metaphors already available to him to describe the people of God. So he speaks of the household of God, the family of God, the, the vineyard of God, the olive tree. Uh, the, the, well, does Paul use the language of flock and herd? Peter does. I can't remember if Paul does. But these are all Old Testament images for God's people. And then he invents a new one, which is unique to Paul, which is the body. Uh, which had not been an Old Testament image, uh, but Paul uses it in a number of places to say, you are the body of Christ, or as possibly translated in one place, a body belonging to Christ. Uh, you are like a body. And of course then he also universalizes that as the church as the body of Christ. It's a slightly extended meaning. So that's the third. And then, fourthly, there's the sense of, of legitimation. There needs to be a, a, a justification of why we behave in the way that we do. Uh, on what grounds do we choose to stand out from other groups? So all social groupings, whether they are civil or political or whatever they may be, uh, will, will have some rationale, some sense of this is why we exist, because we really believe this. And this is what's going to happen, sort of thing. Um, and that could be positive or negative. So Paul gives the Christian church its legitimation uh, in relation to the biblical theology that he's teaching. The Messiah has come. Jesus is Lord. The new creation is already happening within this creation. Jesus will return. So we better live in the light of these things. Uh, live in the light. L behave. Be a community of people who are legitimated and rationalized by this theology, by this story, by this worldview, by people who say that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar is Lord, and so on. So what Eddie Adams was doing at that point is saying that whether Paul knew it or not, he was actually uh, doing for these little Christian communities uh, precisely the things that any social community needs in order to survive and grow and be built up. Uh, providing for them identity, distinctiveness, belonging, and legitimation, but of course in relation to the Christian gospel and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's something of the missional uh, purpose or missional nature of Paul's letters. But then we could move on from that more generic sense of what they were doing in general to something of the missionary theology in the content of Paul's letters. The, particularly the theology that comes out of the context in which they were written. Because, as we know, most of the letters of the Apostle Paul were written to specific churches to address specific issues and problems. Most of them written to churches that he himself had founded. Um, Romans is uh, an exception to that. He quite clearly is writing to Christians in Rome whom he himself had not visited. He hadn't yet got to Rome when he wrote to the Romans, um, although he knew people there, obviously. Um, but most of the other letters are written to churches that he had a personal involvement with. Um, even a, a letter like Ephesians, which seems to be something of a, uh, almost like a circular letter, um, written to the churches of the uh, Lycus Valley, churches like Colossae and Laodicea, in that area, and um, there are scholars who reckon that when Paul at the end of Colossians speaks about, make sure you read the letter that I wrote to the church at Laodicea, uh, that what's actually being referred to there is what we now have is called the letter to the Ephesians. Uh, that it was a sort of a circular letter that Paul intended 
to be read around a number of different church assemblies in that particular part of the world. But for the most part, uh, the letters were written uh, to deal with tensions within the church between Greeks and Jew uh, Gentiles and Jews, or to deal with particular issues in the church that had arisen because of the missionary situation in which they were, problems that were there in early churches, as, of course, uh, all people who are engaged in direct cross-cultural evangelism and missionary church planting know that that's what happens. As soon as a church is planted, there will be problems, uh, there will be questions, there will be challenges, there will be conflicts. Uh, it's just the stuff of life. It's part of what church life is, and it's there in the New Testament. So here's a few examples of that that uh, are there in the page. Uh, First and Second Thessalonians. Um, first Thessalonians is reckoned to be probably the very first letter that Paul actually did write. There are those who would say perhaps Galatians was, but either Galatians or Thessalonians. Uh, and it's very clear that uh, they were written to encourage, to comfort new believers uh, who were facing conflict and persecution very soon after their conversion. Because Paul writes to them, doesn't he, and says that you're experiencing exactly what I experienced in Thessalonica. Uh, attack and um, accusation, uh, trouble with the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities. And Paul says to these Thessalonians, you're, you're having that too. But that's okay, because God will hold you, God will preserve you, uh, and I'm concerned for you. And then he addresses some of the issues that they particularly had. For example, that... Um, uh, some of the believers were dying, or had died, and then the survivors were worried. Well, what's happened to them? You know, Jesus hasn't come back. Uh, you know, uh, are, are they going to miss out on it? Um, and Paul writes, no, they're okay, they're safe, uh, and, and God, Jesus, will bring them when he returns to earth, uh, and we will meet them, and God will set up his kingdom. So there's uh, the theology in, in 1 and 2 Thessalonians is very much related to the problems that are there. Then there's the Corinthian correspondence, uh, the longest of Paul's correspondence to, to the church in Corinth, uh, which clearly caused Paul a great deal of heartache and headache, uh, the, the believers there, all the way through. Uh, 1 Corinthians, of course, uh, taken up with issues that here was a, a group of believers in a city, Corinth, which uh, had the best and the worst of Greek and Roman culture in one city. Uh, the best in the sense that it was a, a, a citadel of um, Roman order and law within Greece and uh, had all the sort of culture of Greece behind it, uh, and yet also the worst in terms of the um, polytheistic environment, multiple gods, and also a very degraded form of sexual cult. The uh, Corinthians were known for their prostitutes, and uh, it was a port city, and, uh, and there was all the, the, that kind of thing. In fact, to Corinthianize was almost a, a, a byword for behavior of that way. It was a kind of term for decadence. And so Paul has to write into that situation about the sexual problems in the church, about the problems of division within the church, and so on. Yes? Sorry, they yeah. They also did. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, I've forgotten your name again, sorry. Sandra. As Sandra is saying, um, it, the Corinthians obviously were able to theologize their sexual immorality by saying, well, because we're risen um, uh, spiritually, it doesn't matter what we do with the body. So they find a very convenient theology to justify um, sexual immorality in the body. And Paul, as you remember, contradicts that. It says your bodies are the t are a temple of the Holy Spirit. When you come to 2 Corinthians, uh, the issue is much more over Paul's uh, defense against his opponents who were challenging his claim to be an apostle. And here, you uh, reading between the lines and reading through that correspondence, it appears that basically the Corinthian believers came to be embarrassed by the apostle Paul. They find him an embarrassment. For a number of reasons, it seems. One, because he was not behaving like leaders should. Uh, and especially leaders of new movements, and especially leaders with new philosophies. Which was what probably, in a Greek context, 
Christianity was at first perceived to be. A new philosophy, a new way of thinking about the world and the gods and so on. And in the Greek world, people who wanted to present a new philosophy would do so uh, with a great deal of oratory, rhetoric. Uh, they would set up a school, they would uh, take fees, um, they would compete with other orators and other philosophers. Uh, and the last thing they would do would be to sort of sit down in a workshop and work with their hands and earn their own living. Uh, you know, real academics don't do that sort of stuff, um, kind of thing. It was a very, uh, there was a certain snobbishness, that's maybe the best English word, for that level of philosophical, academic engagement, and debate, and leadership. And the Corinthians seemed to have wanted Paul to fit into that mold. Uh, to be one of the wise men of the age, to be an orator, to be a rhetorician, uh, to, to be a philosopher. And then they could really have a leader that they could be proud of. You know, Paul is our leader. And clearly some of them would think, well, Paul's not much of an orator. Hey, Apollos is. You listen to Apollos teaching? Wow. You know, he's the greatest teacher we've ever had. And so they, they followed somebody who they thought was a more respectable uh, leader in Apollos. So you see, that kind of thing was creeping in. And so what Paul has to say in his defense in 2 Corinthians uh, is that the very things that uh, the Corinthians were embarrassed about in his ministry were precisely the things that qualified him to be an apostle of the crucified Jesus. Namely, uh, that he had suffered, that he had borne in his own body the marks of, of Christ. And so in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, those are the passages really where this comes uh, to a fore, 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, Paul is defending his apostleship in a way that embarrasses him because he says, you know, I, I really don't want to talk like this, but you're forcing me to it. And he says, if I've got to boast like all these other great leaders are boasting, I will boast about the things that show my weakness, the things that I've suffered uh, and he lists them all in, in 2 Corinthians 11. Uh, because in this weakness, God has shown his power. Uh, and Christ has been made evident. Uh, and also, of course, the fact that he had not been a burden to the Corinthians, but had chosen to either support himself through his own work, or to receive the support of those outside the Corinthian church, namely from the Macedonian Christians. So, 1 and 2 Corinthians then are letters that relate to the, uh, the missionary struggles of Paul with his church. Now, when we want move on to Galatians and Romans, it's a, a somewhat different kind of issue. In fact, a very different kind of issue. Because in both Galatians and Romans, what we have is the controversy or the conflict between Gentile Christians and either Jewish believers or Jews who were trying to reconvert Christian believers back to Judaism or to pull them into Judaism after they had become Christian believers. Uh, and in Galatians, what we seem to find is that after Paul had initially established a church and then moved elsewhere, there were new arrivals, other missionaries, who had come into churches founded by Paul. And these were Jewish Christian missionaries who were, as it were, seeking to impose upon this new Christian community uh, additional claims of the nature of proselytism, the, the, the Jewish proselytes, that these people who were believers in Jesus also needed to be circumcised and to become law-observant uh, believers. Uh, and so the, uh, the issue then was both theological, because Paul is opposed to that completely, because this is a denial of the gospel, but it's also missiological in the sense that it's not uncommon for that to happen. Uh, that when a church grows as a result of an initial church planting movement, it can then be vulnerable to other people who come along, as it were, and simply poach on that ground and then tell people, oh, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. If you're going to be real Christians, you have to have this experience or that experience. And so the church of new believers becomes very vulnerable. Uh, it's, again, a prominent missionary problem. In the, so that's the Galatian reality. In, in the Roman situation, it almost seemed to be the reverse. That's to say that you have a small Jewish community of believers in the midst of a predominantly Gentile church, and that the church was in danger of fragmenting on those two cultural lines between those who were Gentiles, believers, believers, 
and who had embraced Paul's theology of freedom with both arms and said, you know, we're the strong. We, we know that we can eat meat. We are not bothered about Sabbath days. Uh, you know, we, we know that there's no clean and unclean distinction. And they had, in a sense, grasped the fullness of that liberty in Christ theology that, that Paul was teaching. But alongside them, there were, apparently, Jewish believers who were being called the weak ones by these Gentile Christians because these so-called, quote, weaker brethren, well, they weren't so sure about whether or not they should eat meat sacrificed to idols. They still wanted to observe the Sabbath and uh, one day as opposed to others. And, uh, and so they had what we might call more tender conscience about some of those things because of the background that they came from. And so there's clearly conflict between these two groups. Uh, one group is uh, condemning the other. You can imagine the sort of the Jewish believers condemning the uh, Gentile believers for their, you know, playing fast and loose with this dangerous syncretism of uh, unclean food and, um, you know, going to the temples and all that kind of stuff. And you can hear the, the Gentile believers uh, sort of mocking and deriding and looking down on the, the brothers. Oh, you know, you, you, don't, you don't really understand the, uh, the, the full implications of the gospel. And that's what comes out at the end of Romans, isn't it? In chapters 14, 15 especially, where Paul urges these two groups to accept one another. Uh, and the whole sort of tenor of that closing section of the epistle is that there should be neither condemnation nor contempt within the body of Christ. Uh, don't look down on one another, don't condemn one another because we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and Christ has accepted both of us uh, in, in the gospel. But when you look at the, the rest of Romans, it almost seems to be leading up to that because in Romans 1 to 8, Paul is saying that Jew and Gentile are equal. There is no difference in sin or in salvation. There's no difference because all have sinned, so Jew and Gentile are equal sinners. That's the early message of Romans. And Jew and Gentile are equal in salvation because we both have to come through faith in Christ. And so there's no difference. And then in Romans 9 to 11, Paul goes on to show how God's purpose uh, in salvation includes both Jew and Gentile um, and, and, and articulates that theology very clearly in 9 to 11. Well, perhaps very clearly is a bit of an overstatement. Um, <laughs> It must have been very clear to Paul because he was arguing it through scripturally. It's a little bit less clear to us because we haven't followed the grand narrative of the Old Testament story quite so well as he did. Uh, but that's what he's saying, that ultimately God's, God's promise to bless all the nations through the people of Israel has not been dropped. God has still been faithful to Israel. God has not broken his promise to Israel. He has fulfilled his promise to Israel by bringing in the Gentiles. Uh, so that his purpose will be completed. So if that's the case then, he says, beginning now of Romans 12, I therefore beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that if all these things are true, what I've been saying up to this point, then your lives need to be transformed. You need to live differently. And included among the different living is that you accept one another and that you live in unity with one another as you are supposed to be. So you can see then that uh, even a letter like Romans with its profound, intensive, and extensive theology uh, has this practical, missional dimension of encouraging a church in unity. And that applies even to smaller letters like Philemon, uh, this beautiful, very graciously written letter. It just oozes politeness um, in Greek. It is written in very you know, polite, careful Greek, where Paul says, my dear brother, I couldn't possibly command you to do this, but I'm, you know, I'm requesting that you should out of love for Jesus. And of course, it, it really basically means, Philemon, do this. <laughs> but, but Paul writes it in a very gracious way. But what it is doing, it's addressing the problem of, well, what happens when a slave owner has become a Christian of a non-Christian slave, but the slave runs away, ends up fleeing to Rome where all the migrants went, you know, cities have always been attractors for runaways. And so uh, uh, Onesimus ends up in Rome and by some reason or other meets the Apostle Paul, gets converted, becomes a Christian. Now what do you do? Uh, you've got a slave uh, in an illegal situation for which the penalties were very clear. Uh, he could have been put to death. 
Paul could have been put to death for harboring a runaway slave. So what does he do? He writes to the slave owner and says, let's handle this Christianly. Let's realize that now this slave has become your brother, as I am your brother and your father in God. Uh, and so he addresses the whole issue in the context of what the gospel now says about the relationship between human beings, whether or not the human beings are owner and slave. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting little piece of uh, cultural legal problems being addressed through the gospel. Colossians, there as you know the issue is false teaching, probably a mixture of Jewish and pagan syncretism, uh, worship of angels, probably proto-Gnosticism and a whole lot of other nasty things. Uh, and in that Paul in his missional purpose in that letter wants to exalt the supremacy of Christ above all things, uh, above all creation, as the head of the church, uh, as above all powers and authorities and so in exalting the cosmic lordship of Christ Paul then puts all these other things knowledge uh, and uh, power in their proper place because once we have Christ uh, we have everything that we need so Colossians is affirming that cosmic exaltation of Christ and the parallel letter which I haven't mentioned here but maybe you want to write it in of course is Ephesians in which the cosmic Christ will bring about cosmic unification which then must be modeled in ecclesial unity. Um, let me repeat that a little bit more simply. Paul says in Ephesians 1 verses 9 and 10 that God's ultimate purpose is to bring all things into unity under the headship of Christ. That's cosmic unification, cosmic integration, all things being headed up by Christ. And then he moves on in chapter 2 to say, and the first evidence of that is the racial integration, the racial harmonizing of Jew and Gentile through the cross of Christ. So Ephesians 2 and 3 takes that cosmic unification of chapter 1 and applies it to the Jew-Gentile split. You Gentiles used to be like that. Now God through the cross has brought the two, made the two one. And it's the henotes, the heis, the, the unity word which occurs there. Uh, God has made the two one in Christ. So the, the, the racial unification. And then having expounded all of that in chapter 3, Paul goes on to ecclesial unity in chapter 4. And he says, therefore, make every effort to preserve the henotes, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If God has made you one, stay one. Uh, and so the, the demand for church unity um, uh, in chapter 4, well, that it's the unity of love and forbearance one another and love one another, uh, which flows through that, is a continuing implication in practical church life to be a model of what God has created uh, through making the two one. In fact, so much so that Paul uses the same expression in Greek, which sadly most English translations don't preserve. And that's the fact that in, Romans, in Ephesians 2, Paul says that God has created through the cross of Christ kainos anthropos, a new man, a new humanity. And in Ephesians 4, Paul says, put on the kainos anthropos, the new humanity. Unfortunately, most English translations say a new self, uh, which makes the whole thing very kind of individual, personal, and pious. But what Paul is saying is that you, individually and as a group of Christians, you are to put that on, you are to be that new humanity that God has already created in Christ through the cross. So there's that link between the gospel affirmation of what the cross of Christ has accomplished, racial integration, new humanity in Christ and the ethical implication of being the new humanity which is then to be lived out in the way Paul describes in Ephesians 4. And I would add just one aspect of that if one thinks of cosmic integration, rational harmony, ecclesial unity it then becomes ethical integrity and marital unity as well, one flesh. It's most interesting that Paul um, moves through eventually to saying that the relationship between Christ and the church is modeled and demonstrated in the one flesh nature of, uh, of marriage. Uh, 
And he says the same thing about husband and wife as he said about Jew and Gentile in chapter 2. The two shall be one. And he uses the same language, the two become one of marriage that he's used of Jew and Gentile, the two are made one. And so it seems that all the way through this letter, Paul is, uh, as it were, handling this implication of the gospel, this cosmic exaltation of Christ above all things, uniting the church, uh, and in the church then calling the church to express that unity in its ethical life and behavior, and even seeing it modeled uh, in the Christian family, in marriage, husband and wife, and then through the household codes of parents and children and so on. Uh, so those are some examples of, of this. Philippians, another lovely letter written to thank a church for their missionary support. <laughs> uh, Philippians is Paul's um, prayer letter, Paul's thank you letter to a church which had sent him some money uh, to support his ministry. And uh, he, he writes the lovely letter of Philippians and eventually at the end of it gets around to thanking the church uh, in Philippians 4. Uh, although, again, some have said that possibly a purpose of Philippians is simply to reconcile Syntyche and Euodia, uh, two women who are quarreling, and Paul writes the whole of Philippians to help them, you know, get together and sort themselves out. And a little embarrassing for them too, yes, we wonder whether they did. <laughs> we hope they did. All right, so that's something then of the um, missionary purpose of Paul's letters, the mission theology of Paul's letters, and finally, or nearly finally, on to the missionary nature of Paul's doctrine and ethics. Uh, and this was uh, a part of Eddie Adams' lecture that I particularly enjoyed, um, because he showed how some of the core doctrines of Paul's theology also have missiological implications in terms of the gospel and the nations and God's missional purpose. And the first one, possibly surprising to you, but I hope not uh, after all we've seen through this course, is that Paul's teaching about justification by faith is not only a matter of getting right with God at an individual level, although I would affirm that it includes that. Uh, some of you may be aware of the conflict around the so-called old perspective and new perspective on the Apostle Paul. Uh, in the uh, in New Testament theology today, uh, and particularly those who rather take sides on whether you agree with uh, Tom Wright or with uh, John Piper or others, there's a whole sort of argument over that. Um, uh, my problem is, as so often in these things, that people will polarize and go to one extreme or another when the truth is usually found in embracing both. And in my opinion, the, the so-called new perspective actually gives you the old as well. It just gives it a different dimension and flavor and fullness of what Paul is saying. But the point is that where Paul actually teaches about we are justified by faith, through the grace of God by faith, the, the letters that teaches that are Galatians and Romans, the two churches in which a major issue was the division of Jew and Gentile, or the problems caused by Jew and Gentile issues. Um, and that what Paul the, the, the place where Paul first mentions justification by faith ever in his letters is actually in Galatians, uh, in chapter 2, uh, where he speaks about we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a person is not justified by, observe, by the law, by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Why does he say that? He says it in the context of the fact that he had had to oppose Peter because Peter, who knew that, had been eating with Gentiles, though he was a Jew, because he knew, ever since his experience with Cornelius, that there was no more division between Jew and Gentile. Paul, Peter knew that. But now, because certain people had come and had arrived uh, and were trying to draw people back and separate the Jews from the Gentiles, Peter had caved in and was now refusing to eat with Gentiles. And Paul says, I had to rebuke him over that because that was contrary to the gospel. Because the whole point about being justified is that justification is no longer something that is only there for people who are observing the law, for uh, people who are within the old covenant, based on, 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 the, on Mount Sinai and so on. Paul says, now that Messiah has come, that openness of righteousness before God, of the 
anticipating now of the final verdict of God on the day of judgment, that who will be among the righteous, that option of being among the righteous is now open to people of all nations, including the Gentiles. It's not a privilege for the Jews only. It's open to all. And so in that sense, the doctrine of justification by faith uh, is in fact uh, an openness of salvation. No single nation has an automatic claim on God. God is reaching out to all nations, including the Gentiles, that salvation is by grace through faith. And so the doctrine of justification is, in a sense, essentially a missionary doctrine. It's saying all of you out there can come and receive this righteousness of God uh, and uh, experience God's faithfulness and God's forgiveness, and God's covenant blessing. Uh, and so he can say to the Galatians, if you're in Christ, you are in Abraham. You have received the promise of Abraham because it's for all nations. So Abraham becomes the, uh, the basis of Paul's doctrine there. So justification by faith. Secondly, Paul's theology of the cross. Uh, that um, Paul, of course, in Corinthians, this is particularly the Corinthian center of the Corinthian correspondence. In Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 uh, Paul says these famous words, as you remember it, uh, that Jews demand miraculous signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach the Messiah crucified, Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. The cross is at the center of Paul's gospel, but the cross was countercultural in both directions. That's to say the cross was an offense to the Jews who could not accept a crucified Messiah. How could he possibly be the Messiah if he had died on the cross? Good question. And it's the resurrection which gives the clinching answer because God has raised him from the dead and therefore vindicated him, demonstrated who he was. So it's offensive to the Jewish people and of course it was a laughing stock to the Greeks. Uh, the, the very idea that uh, one individual human being in any case could be savior when what you needed was a universal principle. You know, if you're going to have salvation, you've really got to find it through philosophy. Um, and the idea that a man could bring that was laughable. The idea that a man who had been executed under Rome on a cross and who had, you know, that that, that, that should be the means of God's salvation was a laughing stock. So that Paul realizes that the cross confronts both Jewish history and tradition, but it also confronts Greek philosophy and pride and cultural uh, preferences for the way they wanted their salvation to come. And Paul says, we stick by the cross. The cross is counter to both. It confronts society. It confronts culture. Uh, there is an offense to the cross that Paul recognizes. And of course, that's what the Corinthians didn't like. Even the Corinthian Christians find that hard because uh, they, they, they didn't want to go that way, and Paul has to emphasize it. And then thirdly, of course, there's the cosmic Christology of Paul, which I've referred to already, uh, that um, in Colossians, thinking particularly, that Christ is above and through and in all creation, uh, the cosmic power of the gospel. I have to say that Colossians 1, verses 15 to 23, has become... Uh, a fairly key text in my own thinking and reflection about what the gospel is and therefore what mission should be. Um, because it's, it's this amazing statement of the cosmic, united, singular authority of God over all things in heaven and on earth. Um, and, and I'll just read it because it's, it's so, imp so wonderful. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things, tapanta is the Greek, tapanta, all things, a phrase that Paul uses a lot. All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, tapanta, all things were created by him and for him. The totality of the created universe, physical, material and spiritual, were created by and for Christ. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So he sustains the whole of creation. So Paul then moves from creation to the church. He is the head of the body, the church, the beginning and the first born from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God would all God's fullness dwell in him, and through him, 
Jesus, to reconcile to himself, ta panta, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So Paul moves to the reconciling of all creation through the blood of Christ on the cross. The cross is as central to Paul's theology of creation as to his theology of redemption. In fact, Paul sees the two together because it's creation that's going to be redeemed. The salvation of the whole cosmos, tapanta. And then Paul comes to the Colossians and he says, well now you see also you, kai humais, you also were once alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now God has reconciled you. Hey guys, you get to be part of this by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith established and firm and not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that is now being proclaimed in all creation under heaven is I'm quite convinced how that should be translated not to every creature under heaven it's en pasek tise which means in all creation Paul has this cosmic anticipation that the gospel is being preached in all creation because it is relevant to all creation and so as it were you might say the, the, the arena of gospel proclamation has to be the scope of gospel effectiveness if the gospel is for all creation it's got to be proclaimed in all creation that's the vision of Paul. Now what I love about that passage and why I find it very meaningful is that it is a counterweight, almost a reversal of what tends to be the typical evangelical understanding of evangelism. Now again, please do not misunderstand me because I don't want to be heard to be denigrating or uh, in any way maligning um, the sincere efforts of good Christians to bring people to faith in Jesus. Of course we do. Um, that's what we should all be seeking to do. But our tendency is, am I right or wrong in this, our tendency tends to be to say to individuals, you've got a sin problem, sister, brother, uh, and you're going to face the judgment of God with that sin problem, but I can tell you how to get your sin problem solved because Jesus died on the cross for you. Uh, and, and he is the bridge to God, so I can show you how to become uh, saved from your sin, to have forgiveness and to go to heaven when you die. Wonderful. Hallelujah. I don't question that. I've done that myself. Uh, that, that's, that's the way I would seek to share the gospel with an individual. But then we move from the individual and we say, oh, I'm, by the way, there are lots of others of us who have found this to be true and we are in the church and the church is a wonderful place where you will find fellowship and teaching because you're going to need support uh, to be a Christian. So you as an individual believer on your way to heaven need to be part of the church. Uh, and of course we have to go on living in this world because, you know, well, let's face it, we can't do anything else. So here we are in the world um, and uh, so if we can do some good things in the world, in our jobs, that's wonderful. We're not really sure about the world because we're told it's all going to get burned up in the end anyway. Uh, but we'll all go to heaven when we die, so let's just stick with the church and get there. That's a caricature, okay, I'm being unfair, but I think you would agree that the typical evangelic approach is individual, then church, and then somewhere along the line, maybe creation, uh, and for the really keen people, you know, go and count the birds in, in the Algarve or something, if, if that's, you know, what your fancy is. Now, it seems to me that the Apostle Paul has a theology which works in the opposite order, the opposite way round, ends up with the same message, you need to repent, you need to be forgiven, you need to be saved. But it starts in a different place. It starts with the cosmic reality of creation and say God is the God of all creation. Christ is the Lord of all creation. All of creation has been made by Christ, sustained by Christ and redeemed by Christ. And within that cosmic saving work of God, there's a church which Christ is the head of. It's Christ's body in creation. Uh, it, it's, it's, the, it's the new humanity. It's the first fruits of the new creation. So the church is the great, uh, in a sense, core saving work of God. Through the church, God will declare his wisdom to the principalities and powers, as Paul writes in Ephesians. So God's got a new creation. God's got a new humanity. And hey, you know what? You can be part of that. You also. You Gentiles. You Colossians. So Paul comes to the individual believers at the end of the line, says, this is for you also. Isn't it wonderful? 
And he goes on to say that that's the mystery of Christ. Christ among you, the hope of glory, which is how I think verse 27 should be translated. Uh, to make known among the nations the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christos and human. And I think it's not saying Christ in you, i.e. the indwelling Christ. I believe that too. Uh, that's clear Pauline teaching. Uh, that Jesus dwells in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and we bears witness that we are children of God. But I don't think this is talking about the indwelling Christ. It's talking about the Messiah among the Gentiles as the hope of glory. That's the way Paul speaks of the mystery in Ephesians in the parallel passage. So cosmic Christology uh, transforms our faith from being merely how do I get to heaven when I die? into being the fact that there's any possibility of me going to be in the new creation when I die and when Christ comes back is a part, a precious part, of a great cosmic plan of God which includes the whole of creation and includes the reality of the church which I am now a part of. That gives even more significance, I think, to personal evangelism. What Eddie Adams then pointed out, and I'm getting towards the close here, is notice what kind of community would emerge, would be called upon to believe? A community that is shaped by the doctrine of justification by faith, by a theology of the cross, and by a cosmic understanding of God's purposes through Christ, will be a community, first of all, that's not defined by race or culture. There's no ethnic difference. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. And so, here is a community which is radically equalizing of humanity, puts us all on the same footing. We all have to be justified by faith through grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. It, it, it puts every person, there's no superior race or inferior race, no superior culture, inferior culture, no superior gender, inferior gender. It's all one in the Messiah Jesus. So here's a radically equalizing faith. And that was one of the things that puzzled the pagans about the Christians. They couldn't understand it. Uh, how can you have slaves and free people in this community? You know, how, how, how can you have such an attitude towards women? How can you care for the weak and the poor in the same way uh, that you care for each other? There, there's, there was something puzzling about the early Christian community because of that. Secondly, it would be a community that would refuse to be bound by societal and cultural norms and demands. Uh, because if here is a community which is now marked by the cross, then it will be willing as it were, to stand at the foot of the cross and to proclaim that the cross will be uh, a stumbling block to Jews and a laughing stock to pagans. But nevertheless, we preach Christ crucified. So there's something countercultural about cross-shaped Christianity, as distinct, of course, from culture-shaped Christianity, which is what Christendom very quickly became. And thirdly, uh, here is a group of people who accept the sovereign lordship of Christ and therefore radically dethrone all other gods, spirits, powers, including the emperor. And uh, there's quite a, a move in New Testament scholarship now <coughs> detecting and discerning within Paul's theology the traces of a kind of implied anti-imperial cult theology that, uh, um, that Paul was subtly undermining Caesar. Now, of course, we know Paul would tell people, Romans 13, pay your taxes, honor the authorities. The authorities are established by God. They are diakonoi theu, they are servants of God. But nevertheless, Paul could use language which was imperial cult language, emperor worship language, and apply it to Jesus. One of my favorites is where he says in Titus that we await from heaven our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that was a phrase, our great God and Saviour, that was used of Roman emperors. You know, our great God and Saviour Augustus is coming, or whatever it might be. Uh, and, G and Paul says, no, 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 it's not the Roman emperor, it's Jesus. Another one actually may even be the phrase that we've just looked at uh, in Colossians, uh, where we read that Jesus made peace through the blood of the cross. Now Rome also made peace through the blood of the cross. <laughs> quite literally uh, because they crucified their opponents that's what happened and they could crucify them in their thousands as in the great slave revolt 
Uh, the Roman way was the way where they made peace okay, Pax Romana, but that peace was a peace that was imposed by military superiority and by violence. Um, in fact, their own thinkers were pretty cynical about that. Um, one of them, I think it was Cato, who said, Romans make a desert and call it peace. Uh, you know, they just obliterate everything and say, oh, it's very peaceful here. <laughs> Uh, and so it may well be that even that, Paul is saying, the way in which God has made peace is through the blood of the cross, but it's the blood of the crucified Messiah, Jesus. It's that cross which is God's way of making peace, uh, the acceptance of uh, violence and hatred. So what this is saying is that there's a, a, a missional nature of teaching and doctrines which would shape a community not defined by race or culture, refusing to be culturally shaped but uh, cross-shaped and uh, affirming the lordship of Jesus, kurios Jesus, as opposed to any other uh, power or authority, human, political, imperial or spiritual. And finally, uh, we can note the missionary purpose of Paul's ethics, which really is simply an echo of the missionary purpose of Old Testament ethics that I was uh, referring to you rather a long time ago, I think it was back about Tuesday or somewhere, when we were thinking about how God gave Israel his law in order to shape them to be a community of witness, a community of light to the nations. And it seems to me that there's no doubt that the Apostle Paul saw the same thing that the patterns of behavior that he was calling upon from Christians were in order to win others. He even says it about himself. So his, uh, his description of what might otherwise seem to be his inconsistency in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23, uh, was for the sake of winning people to the gospel. So 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23, he says uh, in that passage that um, I am free, and yet I be and belong to no man, and yet I make myself a slave to anyone to win as many as possible. So to the Jews I became like a Jew. That is, when I lived among Jews, he says, I could also observe the clean, unclean food. I, I wouldn't eat, um, you know, uh, I would be kosher. Uh, I would, you know, go with them on the Sabbath. I would behave like a Jew when I'm among the Jews in order not to give offense, in order to have the opportunity to share the gospel. When I'm living among the Gentiles, um, I became as one not living under the law, he says. So he could have freedom in order not to uh, give offense there. He does all these things, he says, for the sake of the gospel, verse 23, that I may share in its blessing. Um, Paul's behavior was governed not by some rigid code uh, that his sort of religion imposed upon him, but by a desire to live in such a way that he would enable other people to come and see something of the Lord Jesus Christ and win them to faith in Christ. Uh, a, a passage which isn't listed on your notes there, but which I think is well worth noting, is what Paul says to slaves in Titus. I've added this later, Titus chapter 2, verse 10, um, where Paul is speaking, as he often does, to the responsibilities of husbands, wives, parents, children, slave owners and slaves, and he says this, this is Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Um, and the literal Greek there is to adorn the teaching of the gospel about the God of our salvation. The, the word is cosmeo. It's the word from which we derive cosmetic. Um, and if I were to say that, you know, Christian witness should be cosmetic, it's rather changed its meaning uh, in, in later days. But the literal meaning of cosmetics is to make something beautiful, to adorn something. And that's what it did mean in Greek, to, to adorn, to decorate, to make beautiful, uh, whatever, whatever it was. And, and so Paul says, by good behavior, by being men and women of integrity and honesty and truthfulness and trustworthiness, slaves can decorate the gospel, adorn the gospel, make it attractive to their slave owners. Uh, slaves who were usually expected to be pretty unruly and surly and rebellious, uh, for which they tended to get crucified, in Rome at least, if not in Greece, Paul says, no, no, by being transformed, by being a different kind of slave, and your master knows that you're now as a slave attending the group of these funny Jesus followers, uh, 
uh, and you become a bit of a Jesus freak, you know, a Christianos, uh, a Christ person, which was the nickname Christian. But he sees that there's something different now, that you're trustworthy, you're not talking back, you're obeying him, you're, you're working hard. That is making the teaching about our Saviour God attractive. There will be something winsome about that. So the ethical behaviour has a missional purpose, says Paul, as of course had said Jesus and Peter, uh, and all based on the Old Testament. Uh, so there we are. Um, it, it seems to me that there's, there's value in looking at the corpus of Paul's writings, and I haven't even picked up Paul in Acts, mostly, although we could go there too. And we see in it that there's a, a missionary dimension to his church planting, to his church teaching, to his letter writing, to the theology of his letters, his doctrines, and to the ethics that he was imposing or that he was recommending to people. I think that's where I'll stop. And um, I don't, do you want to break up into groups or should we just stay?